Peter Ladner. He wears several hats. He owned Business of Vancouver newspaper, which we all we all know. He was a former city councillor of the city of Vancouver, and he authored a book called Urban Food Revolution. Please join me in welcoming Peter Ladner. Well, thanks, Richard, and thanks everybody for um, sticking around. Uh, I really feel honored and a bit humbled to be following all these amazing people who have been dedicating themselves with such um, purity of purpose, I have to say, uh, to give us, bring us food of a quality that we, we wouldn't otherwise get. And uh, certainly a lot of personal sacrifice and a lot of hard work. And uh, I arrive on the scene as a kind of a communicator, speaker, policy wonk. I, I have my own garden and I grow my own food and I go to the farmer's markets and I've recently invested in a, a restaurant that my son started and my daughter who's here with me tonight and works at called Smack and they're pioneering healthy fast food, farm to take out, uh, 1100 block West Pender where they're sourcing locally, but trying to cater to people who want to grab and go and deal with that aspect of people's appetite for food, that style of food, but proving that you can do that too and still have local, fresh, healthy, sustainable food. But lately, I've been interested particularly in the economic sustainability of our local food system. So I've been giving talks to um, regional economic development people and city councils and so on, they come to me, they say, why should we care about local food? Should we get into this as a policy matter? Um, you may know that the city of Vancouver founded a food policy council some time ago. Uh, many municipalities, actually most municipalities now have food policy councils where people like you can get together and the stakeholders and decision makers and players in the industry can get together and figure out ways that the cities can make food more accessible, more local food available, and we see the results just across the street at that wonderful garden there, and so many things that are happening all over our cities, all over North America. And that's really what got me excited to write my book, is I just wanted to chronicle some of this stuff and explain what people are doing, what's possible, and in particular, I just want to focus tonight on a few things about what how it's paying off for people, because um, as we heard earlier, there are a lot of financial struggles in all of this, and uh, figuring out how to grow stuff in an ethical, biodynamic, organic way is one thing, how to make a living at it is another. And how can we support our farmers, because we're not gonna get young people going into farming if they can't make a living at it. And uh, so, I just wanna touch on some of the things that are happening now, as the world is changing and it was wonderful to hear from Andrea the the beginnings of which sounds so far away and long ago long ago and far away with one supplier now so many people are doing these things and new possibilities are opening up pretty much every day to make this more economically sustainable um, the first thing I tell these people is there's a and, and Felix alluded to this, there is a public health benefit that is a huge payback to the public purse for people eating more local healthy food. Uh, we are killing ourselves with eating junk food loaded with sodium salt and fat, a sodium sugar and fat, and 40% uh, of our budgets are spent on basically cleaning up the mess from the food that we're eating which we call the healthcare system, 70% of that money is to pay for people who are dying from preventable diseases directly related to diet and lifestyle. So one of the benefits of local food is that even though it is not necessarily healthier, the very kinds of things we've heard about today, tonight, becoming more conscious of your food, being more aware of where it's coming from, what's in it, uh, really starts people thinking about how they can eat in a more healthy way. When kids, that wonderful TED talk that uh, the gang guy from LA did, when kids grow kale, they eat kale. And you do ramp up your consciousness and your diet when you start eating local. Uh, so I say to people, it's worth your while to invest in 
what appear to be money losing enterprises or give grants to community gardens and so on because you're going to get a payback through the healthcare system. But on a more direct payback, there are some very interesting things going on. I was at a conference in Toronto where Galen Weston, who runs Loblaws, much biggest private employer in Canada in the food business and, and in the food business, said that if you put a local food label on something in a grocery store, the sales go up by 40%. And you've all been to Whole Foods or wherever where it says, we know the farmer, and you've seen the displays, and you've now, BC's kind of getting up there a little bit with their local food promotion. And now I think this is the reason behind the CFIA change of local boundary. The grocery industry has gone to them and said, hey, we can sell way more stuff if we can call it local. Give us a big definition and we can get way more stuff on the local shelf. And uh, my answer to that is, why not just put where it's from, the transparency we talked about earlier, and let you and I can decide whether it's local or not. Felix's stuff to me may come from 700 or 400 or 300 miles away or kilometers away. I'm calling that local. Let me decide that. Um, then we have to preserve the farmland, and we certainly heard about that. And uh, we have in BC, the ALR, as you know, the Agricultural Land Reserve, it's a really rare piece of jurisdiction in North America. There are very few places where farmland is as protected as it is here, and yet we all know that's a problem. It's not being completely protected. It's being eroded and lots of pressures to get it out. Lots of speculation by people who are waiting for the day when it'll get out, driving up the prices, making it very difficult for farmers to just go in there and farm. Um, local procurement is something that's coming on very strong now. Uh, this is where a hospital, a school, a university will buy a percentage of its food from local sources and guarantee a buyer, a customer, for the local farmers. And uh, lots of people have calculated uh, if you take, if everybody in Ontario were to, to spend another $10 a week on local food, you could create another thousand jobs and, and generate People have done this in, in Seattle, they worked out if you, if you diverted 15% of your spending to local that is not spent on local food now, you could generate $2.7 billion or something in economic spin-off. So, um, in Ontario, they've just introduced a Local Food Act, which is going to entice, is the word I hear, uh, institutions to buy more local and encourage them to do that and get the monkey off their back that they won't get charged under some anti-free trade uh, um, regulation. So local procurement is happening, our universities are doing it, our cities are doing it, and it's a very big movement that is really going to help the local farmers. There are also some really interesting private uh, business ventures that are making local food more affordable, and more available, and more financially sustainable. Um, Every grocery chain in North America is now investigating growing food on site, either on a rooftop or in a parking lot or somewhere where they can say, this food was picked this morning, it's very fresh, you know exactly where it came from, and it's very local. Um, so Whole Foods is just right now building in Brooklyn, New York, their very first grocery store, a rooftop farm. There's an organization in Montreal called Lufa Farms. They've had big greenhouses growing year-round. They're now building their second one. These greenhouses are producing half a ton of food a day. They're very big operations. They're seriously contributing to the local food culture in a different way. Uh, and of course, being hydroponic, most of them, um, they use far less water, which is a big issue now. And uh, they're able to lighten the load of the soil on the roof. And of course, we have one here on the rooftop of a parking garage on Richard Street which is called, produces the local garden brand and uh, sells to lots of restaurants around here. So this is another big trend and a lot of that is financially self-supporting. Um, aquaponics is something else that's, that's really catching on where you grow fish in, in tanks and the fish waste is pumped up to uh, go be filtered through soil and green greens that are growing above it and they pull all the, the nutrients and stuff out of the fish waste, clean the water, comes back around again, the fish are fed, and you can harvest the crop of watercress or whatever it is on the top and the fish on the bottom. There are now whole warehouses full of this stuff 
The first one of these I ever saw was actually in Agassiz. Somebody was growing for a um, sea restaurant, and they had tanks, and then the, the stuff would come out, and they had a big garden that was fertilized with the, with the waste from the tanks. This, I think, is the answer to the, to the farm fish, where it's not contaminating the wild fish, and uh, is really becoming quite feasible. Um, there are also a lot of really ancillary businesses that are starting up. People are now in the landscaping business uh, producing food gardens instead of just nice looking gardens for people. And a lot of the landscapers are shifting over to getting food gardens, digging up people's lawns. There's a business there. People are making businesses out of consulting. And uh, then there are also um, accessories that are being sold. There's now a, a website called mypetchicken.com which you can buy chicken diapers you can buy accessories for your chickens and uh, some of it's getting a little ridiculous but it just shows that there's a whole this awakening of interest in local food producing local food being closer to your food is opening up new economic opportunities um, technology is playing a part uh, we are now seeing so many um, online initiatives that are connecting growers and, and buyers. And uh, these are happening so that the farmers can sell direct to consumers. Some of the distribution and, and other issues have to be worked out. But um, another kind of variation on this is the, the community supported agriculture, which we heard earlier about the farmers markets. Just skyrocketing in popularity to the point where a farmer friend of mine says it's, it's getting harder to make money at the farmers markets because there's so many of them. Um, but the community supported agriculture gets money into the hands of the farmer at the beginning of the season. It's a commitment from the buyer that I'm going to buy throughout the season a, a weekly box of goods from this farmer or in fact this fisherman uh, that's now working its way into the fishing industry. And uh, this this uh, gives a much bigger return to the farmer and a lot of it is enabled through technology and getting people in touch through electronic communication. I'm, I'm also seeing uh, new ventures, particularly younger people, crowdsourcing their new farms, their uh, community garden, their project, whatever it might be, going online with Indiegogo and in a week they've got $25,000 that they never could have found otherwise. Um, I want to just end on one thing that is very important to Vancouver, which is vital to this whole industry of local food and local production and is missing here. And we are continuing to struggle to find it and replace it. And that is the local food hub, the local food market where people can, the farmers can bring their stuff in. It's a single place. It can be a year round farmer's market covered and there can be some processing there, uh, perhaps some uh, community kitchens, and you may have heard about the new city market proposal for Vancouver. Hasn't worked, it's been in the works for, I don't know how many, five years or something. A lot of money's been spent on it. Um, in Victoria, for a fraction of the money, they've already got something built. Many other cities are doing this. It can be done, and it is really, again and again, we hear that without this, we're not gonna have a really strong, fully functioning local food economy, local food system, where you can bring all these pieces together and really make it flow and get true value to the farmers. So there are just a few things that uh, I'm keeping my eye on, which I think are pretty interesting, in addition to all the other wonderful aspects of local food and uh, people becoming more aware of what they're eating. And I look forward to the day when it will be really way more financially feasible to do all this and the people who are doing all the wonderful work you heard about earlier will be better paid and uh, there will be better efficiencies and we'll all be willing to make those payments and enjoy local food in much greater quantity and quality than we even already do. So thanks very much.